Good morning. It's a Sunday morning. It's a Sunday morning chill stream. I don't even know what that means. It sounded good. My collar is all screwed up. My shirt's all screwed up. I don't fit in the shirt right. My wife likes this shirt, and so I wear it. I listen to my wife. <clears throat> I am tired. I'm tired. Um, wanted to go into something that I think is fun. I don't exactly know how to do it. We'll see if this works. Oh, no, that'll work. Okay. Okay, here we go. How are you this morning? We're not going to do mortgage rates this morning. It's Sunday. No one's, no one's getting a mortgage today. I have lots we could talk about. I don't even know where to start. I don't only have an hour. Um, you'd think like, hey, that means we just need to get after it. Well, I don't know. I don't want to get to. It's Sunday, right? Hmm. It's like I almost don't know where to go, but let me let me just let me give this to you. This is the houses that I showed this weekend. Actually, not this weekend, just yesterday. And we're going to do a home showing report, I suspect. But uh, let's just kind of go over the. Uh, you knew I was busy. You saw the stream yesterday was kind of a disaster. Today's not going to be much better. I haven't had time to edit the, I, 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 just to be fair, I edit the thumbnail. I change out thumbnails and I add chapters to the uh, stream at the end. And sometimes I'll add an end screen, but that, it depends on whether or not I know that one needs to be put in. Sometimes I forget. We're on our 41st, that's the unofficial count, 44th consecutive live stream. Um, I have to say, just to sit there and scream into the abyss day after day after day. I don't know if it's soothing. I really don't. I don't know if it's soothing. I don't know if it's um, cathartic. I just know that I do it every, every day. It's, it's, it's fascinating. Fascinating. Uh, YouTube stats are down across the board, especially on the main channel. Uh, the podcasts are not coming out with any sort of regularity because I'm just beat. This is like the busy time of real estate. But I'll tell you, um, it's a time of failure for for many agents. And we'll, we'll go through that. But let's just go over the trek from yesterday. So I started in South City. I moved out to South County. I moved up to West County, specifically Baldwin. Then I moved to Jefferson County, which was uh, Imperial. Then I went back to South City. Then I went back to Imperial. Imperial being in Jefferson County. And during that time, I also canceled an appointment in Crestwood and uh, also canceled an appointment and set an appointment and canceled an appointment in Ellisville. That was my day. I started at 11.15. I did not get home until after 8.30. And uh, I went to try and write an article, or an article. Went to try and write an offer, and it was a disaster. And I guess maybe that's where we should start. So uh, my buyers found a house that they like, that they enjoy. We went to write an offer. And they said, well, what's the payments going to be on this if we if we decide to write an offer. And so I said, you know, hey, we have this handy dandy spreadsheet that we got from the lender. Let's pull it out and see what it is. Well, we pull out the spreadsheet, we start putting in numbers and it was just an absolute disaster. It couldn't have gone worse. It, I mean, any number I would put in, it would almost do the opposite of what it was supposed to do. Okay, well, so that's not, that's not good. Okay, the second part is no pre-approval letter. You say, well, what do you mean, John? What do you mean no pre-approval letter? I mean, they had one, but it expired. They went to get one uh, redone, and uh, something got screwed up in the communications between them and the lender, and no pre-approval letter. Now you say, John, 
you should be watching that stuff. I say, you know what, guys? You guys are hypercritical. I mean, what, like, one of the things that I've always been kind of surprised by, but I shouldn't be, but you might find surprising, is that, you know, buyers see a house, they're, like, thinking about buying the house. They're not thinking about the actions required to buy a house. So they don't really pay much attention. Once they get the pre-approval the first time, they don't really care about, like, getting it renewed. Also, rates went up like 150 basis points from when my buyers were looking last time and the sticker shot kind of blew them away. It was bad. It was a bad end to a night. I mean, you can, my whole body hurts. My elbow hurts. My arm hurts. My knee hurts. What am I going to do today? I'm going to go show houses. So anyway, last night, you know, sometimes when things aren't working, like in this case where we can't write an offer because things are just blowing up left and right, we, we have to stop. I have to say, it's over. Tomorrow is another day and we'll try again. You say, well, they'll lose the house. They might lose the house anyway. That's, that's I mean, that's just kind of the way it is. It sucks. I, I get it. You know what really sucks is this collar. I'm going to... I'm going to button the thing up and just be like, it's kind of nerdy. Like it was when I was a kid. I don't know what it is now. Maybe the whole shirt is. I don't know. Anyway, that was, that was not the cherry on top. Also, I thought I was going to write three offers last night. I ended up writing one, and then I didn't even write that one. So I didn't write any. Went from three offers to zero. Not a good feeling. There's a lot of disappointment, at least with me in real estate. A lot of disappointment. From lost listings to... Uh, Offers that don't get made to offers that don't get accepted to sellers that don't choose me. That's the lost listings. I mean, just a lot, a lot to me, a lot more like yesterday. I was busting my hump. Okay. Will I get paid in any way for any of that? Probably not. That's just a waste of a day. I could have uh, gone and thrown a football around outside, I, which wouldn't happen because I'm 44 years old and my arm would fall off. But, I mean, I could have uh, cut the grass. I could have done some gardening. My yard looks terrible. Embarrassing. Um, afraid to try to buy fertilizer because I don't want to even know how much that costs for the year. Um, just annoying. Just annoying. And I tell you, I, I, had, uh, I had thought that YouTube was going to be the, the salvation because I was going to bring this, um, this wealth of knowledge to the YouTubes that it didn't have. And it turns out that nobody wants the knowledge. So, you know, now I'm in this spot where I've got two YouTube channels. I've got, well, actually, I've got four YouTube channels. I've got two, two live stream channels. I've got a podcast channel. I'm doing the real estate business. Um, and, I, like, not one thing is going right. Which can be hard on your life. Let me just put it out there. Anyway, I don't enough about me and being sad. Ooh, take a deep breath. So we could do a housing report. I don't think we're going to do it just yet. I wanted to go off off topic, and I wanted to try and show you something that's uh, frustrating to me, and um, I I don't know if it frustrates anyone else. Now. Uh, Jack Dorsey used to run Twitter. He's from St. Louis. He went to Bishop DeBerg High School. I, in a way, I hate to say it, in a way that anyone's from St. Louis, okay, even if they're a total embarrassment in the national stage, I'm not saying that Dorsey is, but I'm just saying even if you were, people from St. Louis love you. Like It's unconditional love. These, these people could put you in gas chambers, and I think we would still be like, oh, we love you. It's bad. It's bad. It's like hero worship, but a strange sort of city hero worship. And so Jack Dorsey can do no, I mean, to me, can do no wrong. I mean, he does wrong all the time, but he can do no wrong to me in the same way. It's very odd. Very, very strange. But anyway, 
he uh he was blocked on YouTube. His video was blocked on YouTube. And so he's so smug. No no offense, but he he should be. He's he's a he's probably a billionaire. Okay? And he's he's in tech, so he's allowed to dictate and for years he's been allowed to dictate whatever policies he wants across across Twitter. It's, and my command says this and we will do this now uh, I, I, you could say I've got that totally wrong but the censorship that occurs on Twitter is absolutely insane and I, I, I believe I know why it is I believe it's because it's AI and they program a few words and then you just get thrown off I mean you just get automatically flagged there's no way they're monitoring every tweet with a real person I mean that's, let's be honest that's that's the deal so the algorithm sucks as far as weeding out bad behavior and that's what happens anyway his it was at a bitcoin conference and it got it got taken off of youtube and he had the audacity to say why was this taken down like he's you know like like he's some sort of he's able to arbor you know arbitrate or he's the arbiter of information he's allowed to uh, say oh no this shouldn't be taken down Meanwhile, they've taken off a U.S. president. You say, oh, for violating terms and services. You know what? You guys are nuts. The, the people that argue about that somebody should be taken off the platform for violating terms of service, having never read the terms of service, and uh, actually believing the, the just venomous BS that's out there is ridiculous. It's ridiculous. The whole, you know, that's, don't get me started with the, the world it's bad anyway i just i just thought it was funny and so you know what i wanted to do for you because i love my fans all four of you i wanted you to see an article and i wanted to discuss the article about jack dorsey i I wanted you to you know i wanted you to know like what's going on with that with that spot and what happened and let me show you uh Let me show you the Google search. Got nothing. 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 Not one thing. Now, doesn't it seem odd that I know about it? I mean, I'm a lowly... What are we going to call me today? YouTube commentator on real estate and employment issues and uh, real estate agent and broker. And I can't bring you an article of truth about an event that actually occurred because it doesn't show up on Google. Can you believe that? What else don't we get to see on Google? And I'm not, I'm not criticizing. I mean, look, it's their policy and they, you know, but this idea, like we live in a fake world and, and it happened real quick. It happened real quick. Uh, I feel like 10 years ago we knew like people were lying to us, but, but we'd say like, you know, if they lied to us about 10% of the time and it wasn't, I mean, it wasn't, it didn't seem to be on important things. And now it's just like, it's not even lying anymore. It's just flat out not, it just, it gets erased. People get erased. Thoughts get erased. And it's just like strange. I mean, you remember Jimmy the Greek? He got thrown off the air. He, he, he said racist things on online or on, on broadcast television that were just, yeesh, and no coming back from that. But, but, you know, at the time, gambling was illegal in most of the United States, sports gambling. So he was already being, he was already doing something dicey. But now it's like, I don't know. I don't want to have some sort of uh, scale of like, which is worse. Okay. But you're going to block, you're going to block a Bitcoin conference. 
And you're going to, I mean, it's essentially put in the sp- same space as Jimmy the Greek. And how, like, how Orwellian is the term, like, safety (laughs) or community? Uh, This goes against our community standards. Oh, my God. I feel bad because, like, like, I don't have a real community. I'm kind of always been on my own, and I'm okay with that. But, uh... To see the, uh, you know, if people want to be part of my live stream, I mean, I love it, okay? That would be my community, okay? But but the idea that something would go against my community terms of service, I mean, I get it. There's things I don't want to see and there's things I don't want to talk about. But, I mean, to have some, quote-unquote, big brother looking over your shoulder, having them determining what you should see in your community and extending that across, you know, political, spiritual, financial events. It's, it's just odd. Uh, let's just, let's just talk one more thing. You know, I own books like real actual books. <clears throat> the ones you can like, you used to be able to go, get them in a library and you used to be able to just, you know, own them. And then everyone said, well, you don't want to own books. You can get these digital, like a Kindle. You can read it on there and then all the books you've ever wanted can be on this Kindle. What happens when they burn the books? What happens when they censor the books on Kindle and just take them away or don't allow you to publish them in the first place? Then what? And you go back to paper. It's very strange. It's very strange. For all the technological advances we've gotten, we just can't seem to have just blinders on a couple of things. And it's just, it's strange. So anyway, that being said, what would you like to go do next? We can go so many different directions. You want to do a Google search trends? I think that'd be good. Remember, we're on a chill stream this morning. Like, this is my chill, chill voice. Random topic. So, okay. Let's, uh, let's go to see what the official narrative says we can, what state TV says we can talk about today. Sounds fair, right? FDA. FDA is looking into reports of Lucky Charms making people sick. Now, I don't understand this, and, I, and this, is the, this is the thing. I got this on Google search, and I don't understand. I, I, I'm not, but, like, like, this is one of the more bizarre headlines I've seen in a while, because think about it, like, have you ever had White Castle? Have you ever had White Castle at, like, 2 in the morning, hungover, or intoxicated? And you wake up in the morning, and, Ooh, seemed like a good idea. But we don't have the FDA look into White Castle for them producing these wonderful burgers. Um, I mean, if you look at all the food we consume, I mean, how much of it just makes us sick? And, what, and, that, and I hate to say it, but what kind of sick are we talking about? Like, if it's like a high sugary product or high salt... I could give it diabetes. Might be giving us high blood pressure. Is the FDA looking into that? So the article itself is silly. Now, um, cocoa puffs. Have you ever? Have you ever cocoa puffed? Well, doesn't make me sick. Cinnamon toast crunch makes me sick. I mean. I can go down the list of cereals that make me uh, Captain Crunch, Crunch Berries. Oh my God! I'll just I'll eat I'll eat a whole box of those. And they'll make me sick, but it's because I I think because I ate a whole box of them. They're good, delicious. So anyway, uh, what is my point? That's a good question. Thank you for uh, thank you for reaching out with with that. 
Um, my point is, oh, I don't know. I lost it. My point was just that, you know, foods make us sick and does the FDA really look at it? But let's get into the article. I was just thinking, I actually had a thought, a, a thought that came through my mind about how I could uh, somehow turn the camera so that I have like a thing I could do for a YouTube short every day. Because I saw a guy doing it and it's really smart. Or dumb. I don't know. Loki Charms has a legion of fans. A legion of fans. I don't have a legion of fans. Who think the colorful cereal is magically delicious. But some consumers are saying that they had a less than magical experience after enjoying the toasted oats and marshmallow bits. You know, it's a lot of you think that I make... A lot of you think that I'm making jokes. Like, when I'm really just reading... Like what someone else wrote. Now, if you can't, I mean, to me, it's like the whole first paragraph is hilarious. And I don't know, I don't know if it's in, on purpose, but let me do it again. Lucky, Lucky Charms has a legion of fans who think the colorful cereal is magically delicious. But some consumers are saying that they had a less than magical experience after enjoying the toasted oats and marshmallow bits. Ugh. It's just I'm like I had a caramel this morning for breakfast. I say chocolate covered caramel and I'm drinking a Pepsi. Now, this is the uh, breakfast of champions. Let there be no doubt. Just look at me. I mean, the beacon of health. The website I was poison.com which Again, I mean, like, that's why we go to these articles, because we learn new things every day. Features reports from more than 100 consumers. 100. And I don't know if they're verified consumers, so that kind of makes it fascinating. Who say they experience gastrointestinal issues ranging from nausea and diarrhea to vomiting after eating the General Mills cereal. Food Safety News reported. The website describes itself as consumer-led website for diners to report suspected food poisoning or bad food experiences. You know, I was thinking about this just the other day. I was walking into my local grocery store and I was like, I don't, I don't trust this, this whole deal. Well, here's why. Let me just, let me go out. Let me go out of my way to throw shade at someone. I don't know if I, I don't know if I can, I don't know if I'm good at throwing shade, but let me just, let's just get it out there. We may, by the way, we may not get to any, anything today. Hell, I don't know. It's 23 minutes in and I'm confused. I'm just confused. So anyway, I'm going to the store, okay? And they have a barbecue pit set up outside, okay? That's like a whole setup. And then inside the store, they sell things related to the barbecue setup. But you know, I've never seen the barbecue setup being used. Like, I almost think that it's fake. I almost think that it's set up just to be like, oh, look, we're having barbecue. And then, like, they're just cooking it in the oven in the back. Anyway, my thought was, and that is like, look at all this food in here that could probably make us sick. Anyway, let's continue. Have had abdominal pain, nausea, and diarrhea for multiple weeks. I eat every day, Lucky Charms. Oh, my gosh. We had an ad just try to attack us. Recently stopped eating them and I started to feel a little better. Still have abdominal pain. Says my son eats Lucky Charms a few weeks for breakfast. He's been having stomach problems for the last four months, missing school from vomiting and diarrhea. Good Lord. There's been no official recall of the products as of April 8th, two days ago. But General Mills spokesperson, Andrea Williamson, told Today Food that food safety is the company's top priority. Uh, that's not. You know what their top priority is? Making money. And that's what they do. We take the consumer concerns reported via third-party website very seriously. After a thorough investigation, we've not found any evidence that these complaints are attributed to our products. We encourage consumers to please share any concerns directly with General Mills to ensure that they can be appropriately addressed. We will address your concerns appropriately 
It says it continues. When it comes to matters of food safety, the Food and Drug Administration often updates its website with information about potential recalls and investigations. An FDA spokesperson who doesn't have a name, not allowed to be named if you're in the FDA, told today that the agency does not discuss the specifics of possible or ongoing investigations by policy, but shared the following statement via email. Okay, I'm going to stop you right there. I would like to talk about deodorant for a moment. I had deodorant problems. Unilever makes this, uh, I forgot the name of what I use. Uh, I don't remember. But it's, it's like black and white is the, is the outside of the packaging. And I, I, I bought it, okay? And I bought, you'd get like two in a package. And I bought it, and when I went to use it, when I went to use it, the, um, the whole deodorant fell right out of the tube. It was a like a you know, roll on. I I don't I don't think they I don't I don't know if they still make roll ons, but this was more of that you know. Whatever you do, it wasn't spray. Okay, I was like, well, that sucks. And so then, I had to open another one because that one had just fallen on the floor. There's no no such thing as a five second room for for deodorant. So I. I turned on the other one, I opened the other one, and the same thing happened. I was like, you know what? Like, I, I like this deodorant, but this, this is problematic because I, I, can't, can't keep, I can't keep buying a product and then just throwing it on the floor. And that's going to cause a wide-ranging uh, number of implications. I don't think implications is the right word there. I don't know. I wanted to use constituents, but that doesn't make any sense. Wide range of issues. It's going to cause a wide range of issues. Uh, alternative to those of just, I just want to use deodorant in the morning. So I, I call, I, well, I don't know if I called. I'm pretty sure I, I might have. But Unilever is the company that's behind them, and they're a monstrous company. And I called and I said, actually, I remember this. I called and I said, hey, I think I called. Anyway, hey, this was a while ago. You know, I love your deodorant. I really do, but it keeps falling out of the tube. And like, I, this isn't good for me. And they're like, well, really? This is terrible news. I said, I know. I said, well, what's the number on the back? And so I gave them the number on the back. They said, look here. We appreciate you buying our product. Okay. And we're going to send you vouchers. We're going to send you four. You're going to get four free deodorants on us. At your local store. I said, oh, really? They said, yes. I said, well, thank you. Thank you. And they're like, you know what? You're welcome. We hope that this uh, solves your issue. If, if it doesn't, you can just give us a call back. Yeah, okay. So okay. You know what? I've never had that issue again. And I got four. I mean, I could understand giving me two because that's how many I lost, but they gave me four. So, like, sorry for your trouble. Here's, here's two more. You know the impression that made on me? I can't tell you. I can't tell you how. I mean, I'll probably never leave them unless they discontinue the deodorant. And, like, I'm not going to bash them ever because I just thought that was wonderful. Now, maybe I got lucky. Or maybe I got the right person. or Maybe they knew who I was back then. Like, you know, I'm an Internet celebrity. Uh, no, that's not true. You, you, you're aware of that. So anyway, I think that's the way to, I think all companies should respond that way. What if Twitter had that kind of customer service? What if you could say, hey, man, like I love using your service. I like to tweet multiple times a day, but, you know, you, you didn't let me tweet this, and it, it wasn't really that bad. And they say, oh, I'm sorry. You say, well, yeah, it's okay. I, I mean, I accept your apology. And they say, you know what? Let me make that up to you. I'll, I'll, let, I'll put out four tweets for you. And they'll go like, they'll be, you get all kinds of impressions and people will like them and it'll be great. Is that, would that make you feel better? Yeah, it would. Yeah, it would. So anyway, that's what I'm saying is there's like a way to do customer service that people might, might enjoy. Now in my business, it's kind of fascinating. Real estate, like real estate sales. Like, so say I'm representing the buyer 
and we buy a house and the seller doesn't clean the house very well at the end of the, when they move out. So the buyer's like, hey, this kind of sucks. And I say, you know what? It kind of does. Let's go in on getting a cleaner together because I don't really want to, you know, some people you're never going to be, be happy with anything. So, you know, hey, let's go in on a cleaner. Let's get this cleaned up and go on down the road. You say, John, why are you, why are you taking some responsibility that should be that of the seller? Well, I mean, I represented the buyer. Buyer's not happy. This might make the buyer feel a little better about things. And I'm, I'm all there. I'm there to do it. And you say, well, I see, I see what you're saying, but like, but isn't it, I mean, isn't it kind of people get upset about real estate all the time on the buyer and seller side? Yes. Yes. And here, let me, let me give you an example of that. I say, I have a house I'm selling. Okay. Beautiful house painted wonderfully. Sellers leave, they leave the paint. And they label every single, everywhere the paint color goes, they label it on the, on a label, on the can. Okay. Do you know that some would say, some buyers would say, they'll call me and scream at me and say, they left their paint. Now I have to remove it. So I was trying to be nice. Oh, no, they weren't. This is a hazardous product. Now, paint's made out of basically water now and some other stuff. Probably safe enough to eat. I don't know for, for a fact, but I'd have to look at IWasPoison.com to determine if you could eat your paint. But anyway, some people would be like, you know what? I don't even like the colors, but I appreciate the effort. I do not have a, oh, I've actually seen where someone will write in the contract, paint must be removed before, you know, closing. Do I want to work with those buyers? No, because they're jerks. It's not because I don't want to move the paint. It's because you had to put it in the contract, in the offer. What the hell is wrong with you? I don't know. World's gone mad. I mean, I met just so many instances of it. Anyway, let's continue with the article because I kind of got off topic there. So by the way, what would like to me, what I've noticed online, the behavior is this. If you don't like a product, you don't just go to the, you don't go to the website of the product and tell them you go everywhere else that you possibly can to complain about it. That way you can injure the company much more than just, you know, getting it for free deodorants like I got. Anyway, um, here we go. When it comes to matters of food safety, oh, I'm sorry. As we said, this is the food and drug. I don't, I don't understand this. It says, as we said, we are aware of the reports on IWasPoison.com. So the government is looking at a website, IWasPoison.com. That should creep you out. And they're looking into them in addition to information shared with the CFSAN Adverse Event Reporting System, a database that contains information on adverse event and product complaint reports submitted to the FDA for foods, dietary supplements, and cosmetics. The spokesperson revealed, why are they revealing anything? That the FDA SARS VOTA data shows 41 reports related to Lucky Charms since 2014. There were three adverse event reports in 2021, and only one seemed to be related to the IWasPoisoned.com complaints. Now, I suspect, and I could be wrong, I suspect like Lucky Charms cereal is sold, I mean, if you want to like buy the pound or buy the box, God, more than a thousand, I mean, it has to be more than a thousand boxes a week. Have to be in the millions per year. And only three? Only 41 since 2004? Furthermore, the agency has received no calls at the FDA's Food and Cosmetic Information Center related to Lucky Charms. Now, let me tell you something about myself, little old me, John Andrew Schink. I 
don't know the phone number to the FDA Food and Cosmetics Information System. I don't know anything about the CFSAN Adverse Event Reporting System. I wouldn't even know what to do if I had a problem with a product other than to call the manufacturer and be like, hey, I've got a problem with your product here. Can you do something? Can you help me out? I mean, are people going to... Oh, my God, Jake Sullivan. That guy's... That guy's trash. Uh, Can... uh, I don't know. Man. I just don't get it. Here's another one. I know this This is like people like to do the what ifs and all this or what about us and everything like this. And like, I don't know if you've seen the cesspool that is the Twitter comments, but like every time you point something out, like watch this. Hey, like if you feel like Lucky Charms is making you sick and this is just me, maybe you shouldn't eat it. Okay. This This seems like a reasonable response. Now, someone would tell me it's a private company. I guess it's a private company. It can do whatever it wants. But I I mean, my, my my central thought is that you just shouldn't eat the cereal if it's making you sick. Now, I can understand like the hidden hidden tax of, you know, like this, this is giving me like a long-term disease. It's high in sugar or salt or something. Maybe, maybe, I mean, I, I guess I would see that, but nah. I don't think I'm doing a show report today. I don't feel like it. It was, it was too many houses. And I don't want to relive it. I don't want to relive it. It was bad. But let me let me talk for a moment about something that I saw on the uh, the showings last night, and just uh, just kind of send it your direction. Do you guys believe in omens or like mythical events occurring during your your showings that might like pretend to doom? I kind of do. I kind of do. Well, I mean, I, w- I would do that. I-, I might do a showing report. To- Hell, I'm showing houses tonight. I don't know. There'll be showing reports at some point. But anyway, let me just do one. I was at a house, and I went with the husband because the wife was working on a Saturday. I know. Not a real estate agent. But anyway, so she goes, or we go with the husband, and beautiful house. Gorgeous. Best house I've seen in many 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 months and i've seen a lot of houses wasn't cheap wasn't cheap the asking price wasn't cheap and what you'll probably have to spend over asking is not cheap sorry like this feels good about right there oh my neck is anyway so we go to the house it's gorgeous so gorgeous that i say and my buyer says, hey, man, I would like to bring my wife through here. I said, yeah, I think that'd probably be a good idea. Can't buy a house without the wife, so can you come back? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I set another showing for the evening. And so when we come back, wife brings the little one. She's four. And she is just wild. I'm not going to say her name. I don't want, I don't want anybody to, to know. But this, this kid's just fun. I mean... I don't have to deal with a kid every day, you know, like I have my own. So this kid here doesn't bother me at all. And in fact, it's funny because she's just, she's got some energy to her. So anyway, we go to the house and walk through and the wife says, you know, this is, this is a wonderful house, but we open the door to the uh, back, I'd say patio. And um, wife walks out looks around, four-year-old looks out, says, hey, hey, John. I said, hey, what's up? 
They're like, hey, there's look at this here. Would you tell them to remove this? I'm like, oh, good, good Lord, what is it? It's a dead bird, a cardinal. Cardinal dead, laying on the ground on the porch. Apparently had flown into the window and just bloody. So to me, like that's not good. It's like a bad, it's a bad omen. Like we're not getting this house. Something's going to happen. This is bad. I don't know. What do you think? Are we going to get the house? I probably have as much insight as you do on that one. But yeah, like, I don't know. I, one time I had a, one time I had a, a client, I don't know if I ever told you, but I had a client that died while I was listing her house. That, that didn't feel good. I mean, that really felt bad, actually. Like, real bad. Like, probably should have gone to therapy for it. But, eh, whatever. Whatever, I'm fine. Everything is good. But anyway, bad omens. That would be a bad omen to me. I, I'm haunted by it now. I did sell the house for probably at asking at the time. That was a pretty good uh, deal. But, uh, man. Ugh. So, anyway, that's that. Now. I, why not? Why not? Might not get to anything today. Might just put it all tomorrow. Uh, just things that happened yesterday were just crazy. There was, there was, I, did I tell you? I don't know if I told you, but I was, at a, I was showing a house. And my buyer was on the porch. And I had not gotten there yet. And another group of buyers was going in. The agent literally unlocked the door, put the key back in the lockbox, and then locked the door behind them so that when I got there, I had to unlock the lockbox and do the same thing again. So annoying. And you're like, well, they were just protecting me. No, they were just, they're losers. And you know what? Someday it's going to catch up. It's going to catch up to them. But I had another thing that happened that was weird yesterday. I was driving down a street and I saw these people that were agents because I know it was an agent because I just kind of know what agents look like when they're showing houses. I don't know. And there was a sign in the yard that said for sale and they were walking this way and I was showing a house down the street. And so I, as I'd gotten to the house down the street, I went to unlock the door and they literally got up right behind me. These, these people that were just at the other house. And I'm like, I mean, could I have a little space with my buyers? Just a little. So then I take it, I unlock the door. I was like, come on in. Uh, I said, I'm going to go. Why don't I go one way and you go the other? So that's what we did. Totally normal. No, no issues. And then she started talking and she's like, I'm going to put the key box here. And I'm like, well, it was fine where it was, but whatever. And then oh, we're walking around. And then the lady says, I'm going to go outside. I said, okay. So I think we're going to be leaving too. I said, I think we're going to be leaving too. Why don't you just lock up when you leave and everything's good. So like, no, I'm going outside. I'm like, She's like, I'm not coming back in the house. Like, you didn't even look at the backyard. It's like, whatever. Like, how do I, I'm trying to explain this to you in a way that makes sense to someone. I don't, I don't have this rivalry with agents. I don't care. You're out there trying to make money. Fine. I really don't care. I don't. You know, like your buyer, your buyer is no concern of mine, okay. And like, if you, you know, if I go on a listing call and you beat me on a listing, whatever. I mean, it happens. I've beaten others. You know, it's just. But you know, I don't have this desire. I don't. I know it sounds weird. I I don't need manufactured drama by an agent. I'm just doing my job. Just this is what I do. I help my buyers buy houses. I help sellers sell houses. So, um, I see no reason to be anything less than just pleasant and happy with other agents when I'm in a house showing houses. It just to me, it seems like the thing to do. 
and why the, some of these agents have this uppityness, like they're so important. It's like, look, you're literally showing the same house I am and we're not in the best part of town here, Missy. You know, like all the work you're doing and everything still leads you to right back at this point. So come on. Anyway, and then I think as I left, somebody else came in. And I had another house where people were inside, and I was like, well, we'll just go to the backyard yesterday. I mean, we don't have to go in the house. We can just go in the backyard. So we went in the backyard, looked around, went inside. And he's like, hey, are you the agent? I'm like, yeah. She's like, I'm going to leave the key right here. I said, well, thank you. I, look, I leave the key in the door. Okay, I don't carry the key with me when I'm going to show a house. You say, why? Well, um, have you ever have you ever walked away from a house with the key? I have. I have. I have. So that's it's part of my way to not have that happen. The other thing is, I'm one of my biggest fears is leaving a house unlocked. I don't care about lights, but unlocked, that's not good. That's like bad real estate. So I always get freaked out. Like I told you uh, f- Friday night, I woke up in the middle of the night in a you know cold sweat thinking some agent had call it was calling me and yelling at me about my um not locking a door. So yesterday same house as the lady that said I'll leave it in the thing. Okay, so I go and I I lock up. I go to my car to leave because I had like four other showings. And uh I was like, "Oh god, did I lock the door?" cuz I was Sometimes I'm not paying attention. So then after my buyers left, got back out of the car, went back up to the house and checked to make sure I put the key back in the lockbox. Just for that peace of mind. I'll tell you, that was something. The idea though, seriously, I leave the key in the door, but now here's where it, it bites me sometimes. Sometimes the garage has a lock and sometimes the key to the front door also keys the lock to the garage. And sometimes... There's like four keys, and I don't always know what all those mean. So I, I typically leave them in the, in the front door, and then if I have to go get them, most of the time my buyers are like, by the time we get to the garage, they're like, I'm not into this house. You know, there's, do you know how many houses I show that don't get offers or anything? I showed like, what, 14 yesterday? No offers. It's a lot. It's a lot. And then when you have listing agents try to short your commission because we're not worth it. Hurtful. 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 But whatever. Uh, I don't know. Let's look at some houses in Austin. Let me, let's come along with me for the, the Austin trip. Luxury homes in Austin, Texas. $45 million, six bedrooms, seven and a half baths, 15,000 square feet on a 25 acre lot. And I can't, I mean, from the picture, it looks like there's a waterfall and it's close to a lake. 12, I'm not going to give the address. Uh, $2,923 per square foot. It looks like it's close to a lake. I didn't know there was a lake in Texas, but that's because I'm not from there or close to Austin even. So here it is. Single family home, been on the market three days, built in 2004. Property details. Oh boy, that's a lot. I might, I might read through it, but let's look at the property history. Oh, last listed in 2016 for $2.7 million. Now it's on the market for $45 million. Villa Del Lago is a unique and magnificent waterfront estate of 25 hillside acres along the most prime south shore of Lake Travis. Commanding lake views from every room, the main house of approximately 15,400 square feet offers seven bedrooms, 10 baths, five fireplaces, a media room, theater, library, bar, game room, gym, wine cellar, and abundant outdoor living, summer kitchen, and entertaining spaces. I don't think you can do wine cellar and abundant. But anyway, the meticulously designed landscaping, lawns, and gardens feature native plants, trees, shrubs, in addition to extensive seasonal plantings, all accented 
with comprehensive landscape lighting and several dramatic cascading waterfalls seamlessly carved into the hillside, bespoke stone staircases, pathways, bridge, and fish pond all naturally blend in flawlessly complement this special waterfront estate. A substantial separate structure serves as an entertainment pavilion with a private gated entrance, commercial kitchen for catering, valet area, and additional parking spaces offers a unique opportunity to host gatherings large or small on property, but comfortably away from the main residence. The pavilion has a massive fireplace, two-story ceiling heights, two bars, three bathrooms, and conditioned changing areas. It is exquisitely perched on a gentle sloping hillside with breathtaking views of the lake and evening sunsets. One of the finest luxury waterfront estates in all of Austin. Well, okay. There's your waterfall. I mean, it's you can't. It's undeniable. That's that's that is curb appeal right there. Look at that. There's the lake. There's the infinity pool to the lake. Out, outdoor space. You know, and it's like, look at this. And it's like, I don't know about that. But it's like this. Like, look, look at you, John. You're living in a 1,500 square foot house in South County. Like, you know, like your, your entire house would fit into like one of these rooms. I mean, it's, it's nice. Only 36 pictures. That's really good for me. Is it garish? Yes. Yes. Is it ostentatious? Yes. Yes. Look at that. There's just a pavilion. Hey, meet us at the pavilion. Oh, okay. Chilling at the pavilion. I don't know. I mean, that's not very pretty. And you don't own it, I don't think. Lake Travis. Okay. I mean, you saw it. 45 million. Compass Real Estate has the listing. That's the brokerage. You want to look at another one? I'll look at another one. That was something. This is 12.2 million, seven bedrooms, six and a half baths, 10,450 square feet on a 2.4 acre lot. 12 million. 162 days in the market, four car garage built in 2022. Eh. What is the uh, details on this one? Oh, I'm not going to do that. It's too big. Moreland Properties. That's this one. That's interesting. You know what? This isn't done. This isn't real. This is all computer. We're not doing this one. Sorry. Sorry. This is new construction. Not interested. This is interesting because it doesn't show the inside of the house. So I'm not really into that. This one here, 8.9 million. On a three acre lot. Let's look at that. Shall we? Come on here. Three-car garage built in 1995, 207 days on the market. Have I been in this house? I don't remember if I have. It's pretty. It's a pretty, pretty kitchen. I mean, no doubt. I think that's a separate kitchen. I haven't seen a sauna in a long time. It looked like there was one in there. I mean, that's that's a very nice, it's a very nice backyard. Have you seen a pool though? 
I can't spend, there it is. I was like, I can't spend $9, $9 million and not have a pool. And like, do you remember that I was, you know what? I'm kind of done with Austin. I mean, they're all nice and everything. I just, I'm just not, I, don't, I guess I'm not feeling it today. This one here I like, this shack. It's right next to the lake. Anyway, let's, let's, I'm going to do this here. I'm going to go base, no frame. We're going to go to an article. Right, we're actually going to do more than I thought we were going to do. I, I don't know why. I'm trying to get everything in order. Let's see what's going on here. I haven't even checked the chat. I'm sorry. If you've been, if you've been watching and you've been trying to find, you know, like, Hey John, what's going on? I apologize. I'm, I haven't been paying attention. You know, at this point, it's just, we just keep going. All right. Let's get to an article that says, now do you trust the Pew Research Center? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know who the Pew Research Center is. I don't know. I mean, it says numbers, facts, and trends shaping roles. But what's a fact? I don't know. I, I thought it'd be interesting to read it. We'll see if I believe what I'm reading. Rising share of Americans say the availability of affordable housing is a major problem in their local community. In October 2021, half of Americans said that this was a major problem where they live, up 10 percentage points from 2018. In the same 2021 survey, 70% of Americans said young adults today have a harder time buying a home than their parents' generation did. Who knows? A variety of factors have set the stage for the financial challenges American homeowners and renters have been facing in the housing market, including incomes that haven't kept the place with housing cost increases and a housing construction slowdown. A surge in home buying spurred by record low mortgage rates during the COVID pandemic has further strained the availability of homes. Here's some of the key measures of the housing affordability crunch in the United States and the reasons behind it. Well, I'd like to see the reasons behind it. Home sales have boomed after housing listings have dropped and median home sales prices have surged. The number of active listings in the U.S. was as lowest in less than in at least five years in January 22, with 408,000 listings on the market. That's a 60% drop from, drop from about 1 million listings in February 2020 just before the coronavirus recession hit the U.S. Around the same time, the national median sale price for a single family home jumped 25% from 327 in the fourth quarter of 2019 to a full quarter affected by COVID, which was uh, to 408,000 in the fourth quarter of 2021, the greatest recent, or the most recent data available, the greatest increase, increase in the West, Midwest, and Northeast. Housing vacancy rates, meanwhile, have dropped over the last decade. Vacancy rate for vet rental units fell from about 10% in 2010 to 5.6% in 2020 when the rate for homeowner units is down from about 2.6% in 2010 to 0.9% in 2021. Housing affordability has been squeezed by a near record increase in the number of American homeowners since 2020. Pew Research Center analysis of the U.S. Census Bureau found, data found. Oh. There was an estimated 2.1 million more homeowners in the fourth quarter of 2020 than there were a year earlier, equal to previous record increases in homeowners, which occurred during the housing boom between 2003 and 2004, and it ended in 2007. During 2020, the U.S. home ownership rate also increased to 65%, up from 65.1 a year earlier, a large year-over-year change, but still below the historical peak of 69.2% in 2004. The home ownership rate in the fourth quarter of 2021 was not statistically different from the rates in the fourth quarter of 2020. Homeowners among homeownership amongst household head by white. I'm not going to do the white and black thing. I, I'm done with that game. Um, 2020, 46% of American renters spent 30% or more of their income on housing, including 23% who spent at least 50% of their income this way, which is it's terrible. It's terrible. Renters across the U.S. have seen the average. And I, that's one thing I don't understand is why are we sitting there and saying that um, why why do we think that like if you're a renter and the rents rise. I mean, that's what happens in rentals. The 
they go down. They go down when there's fewer vacants or fewer occupants. occupants. Demand, less demand. Renters across the U.S. have seen the average rent rise 18% over the last five years outpacing inflation. That's right. That's right. Renters tend to skew toward the lower ends of the economic scale when it comes to income and wealth. I don't, I'm not interested in kicking people on the lower income ends of the economic scale. Having been there many times myself and really straddling it, I would just say that, yeah, I get it. And then that's it. This was really not a very good article. I think it's kind of a mood thing, though. I'm just not in the mood for this. I don't want, I don't want to hear about this. I'm living it, you know. Oh. Now, one last, one last bit of news. We're going to do this. Top four brokerages captured a historic rise in market share. I just wanted to talk about this story for this reason. Um, it's important. It's important. 2021 real estate market was for, one for the aged record low interest rates and housing inventory gave way to record high home prices and sales. Capitalizing on these market factors, brokerage firms in the 2022 Real Trends 500 brokerage rankings broke records in market share, closed transaction size, and sales volume. The top four, Rheology, Home Services America, uh, Compass, and EXP Realty, now have a 20% market share in the U.S. These four brokerage companies did just over $20 billion in residential gross commission revenue. In 2021 rankings, these same firms just closed over $14 billion, so the increase was 43% in one year just among these firms. But house prices were up. 35%. Some of this gross was due to the increase in the value of the home sold. <laughs> I didn't even have to read the article. But a large part was growth through both acquisitions and organic means. I don't recall seeing this kind of one-year growth ever. Well, look, the market is crap. You know better. It says Real Tens released its 2022 brokerage rankings today. And for the first time since the late 90s, Realty Brokerage Group or Home Services America were not in the top spot by sales volume. Relative newcomer Compass snuck by Rheology to claim number one. All firms in the 2022 Real Trends did approximately 40% of all brokerage controlled sales in the country, up from 38% in 2021, with 35.9% of all realtors. And so, what does that tell you? Well, like independent brokerages like my still, still employ a, a, a good amount of realtors, basically. Agents with the RT500 firms had an average of 7.9 transactions per agent. The average number of agents per RT500 firm was 1,138, from, up from 1,025 1, last year. Realtrends has been the undisputed leader in the ranking of real estate brokerage firms. I agree with that. Um, due to Realtrends and RTC Consulting's large valuation and M&A practice, we have access to hundreds of brokerage financial statements every year. Because of those financial statements, we are advantage to determine the accuracy of the numbers submitted to us which serves an additional layer of verification in the process we use. I, I don't have a problem with real trends. Leaderboard by transaction sites. Since 2018, Berkshire Hathaway, Bethemus, Beth Bethemus, Bohemoth, Home Services America has taken the number one transaction sites with more than 38, 388 sites. Each real estate transaction has two sided buying side and selling side. Before 2018, NRT, now Rheology Brokerage Group, maintained that top spot. Now, Rheology Brokerage Group, comp composed of company-owned offices of Coldwell Banker, Corcoran, and Sotheby's. I forgot they had Sotheby's. is number two with more than 376,000 transaction sites. Neither of these numbers takes into account the many franchises of either brand. Cloud-based brokerages, ESXP, continue its meteoric rise to the number three spot by transaction sites with more than 355,000 transaction sites, led by founder and CEO Glenn Sanford. The company hopes to add former Keller Williams CEO to its leadership team pending litigation with Keller Williams. Willis played a key role in the massive growth of Keller Williams between 2005 and 2014 when the company grew from 700 agents to 140,000 agents worldwide. Compass took the number four spot by transaction size. Perhaps the biggest news of all is that the 10-year-old self-proclaimed real estate technology brokerage Compass 
snuck by Rheology to take the number one spot by sales volume with 251 billion in sales in 2021, ending an almost 20 year run of RBG in that spot. Rheology was a close second. Compass rose quickly to the top by acquiring agents and teams rather than brokerage firms, which was the primary way to grow quickly for many firms. When today's Rheology brokerage group bought Coal Banker in 1996, they soon rose to number one for many years. They got there largely through that major acquisition. Compass got there largely through key acquisitions of top producing real estate agents and teams, which was a different way to go. Compass also had a few key brokerage acquisitions, including Pacific Union International Realty in 2018. While still focused on recruiting, Compass CEO Robert Refkin suggested in his February 2021 earnings call that Compass is not giving, up, is not giving agents the compensation packages it has in the past, stating 62% of agents who recently came to Compass are receiving a less favorable split compared to their brokerage. Also, fewer agents are getting equity, Refkin said. Instead, Refkin will be focused on innovation to improve per agent productivity. The third largest firm by sales volume is Home Services America with $199 billion, followed by EXP Realty at $132 billion. Low fear, low cost brokerage is gaining traction. Of the 25, this is kind of fascinating, of the 25 Real, Real Trends 500 brokerage firms by transaction size, eight firms or 32% of the top 25 firms are considered low fee or low cost firms. Now you think, oh, that's great. Those are flat fee listing companies. Low cost or low fee firms charge a flat fee to the agents, have higher splits to the agents than traditional firms. So that's not what you think. By far the biggest of this is eXp Realty, at number three by transaction size, followed by Redfin, HomeSmart, United Real Estate, Fathom Realty, West USA, My Home Group, and Samson Properties. Um, all I can say is this. There's a war going on amongst brokerages, okay? And they fight each other. And it's like, you know, a lot of fighting. And then for me, like, I'm, I'm not in the fight. Like, no one's recruiting me. I have my own brokerage. They try to recruit me from time to time, and it's like, no. I mean, go pound sand. Thank you. But, you know, I don't, I don't, I live in the ecosystem that they, that they are creating. I, I, I exist in it. I don't set any sort of trends or anything like that. I do my business. I help buyers buy homes. I help sellers sell homes. Okay. I deal with all the other crap that these other brokerages bring my way. But, you know, that's my business. That's how it goes. Um, am I scared that they're going to, what am I scared that they're going to do? You understand what I'm saying? I mean, they, they're already like huge. So I'm not, I'm not scared. I'm not worried. Only thing I'm worried about right now is I might have forgotten to switch over to the screen, do the article. So you might have just seen me reading without kind of any context, which would be bad for streaming. But no one's there anyway, so I don't have to worry about it. Anyway, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call it quits. I'm running a little bit late. i got to show some houses this afternoon. Hopefully write some offers. That would be good. I don't know. I guess we should have talked more about my showings today, but I, I, just, I, just, I just gave you the highlights. With that, I'm going to head out. Thank you for watching. I will catch you tomorrow at 9 a.m. Hopefully I'll be better off. My, my, I'm tired, but uh, thank you for watching. And if you're watching down the road two years from now, hey, subscribe. I know that you may not want to subscribe, you know, right now, 4-10-2022, but, you know, two years from now, just know I'll still be on the Internet. Like, look me up. Like, subscribe, okay? Then, then you'll see more of my videos in theory. But if you just watch the videos, that's good too. Whatever you want to do. I, I would like to have more than... What I have like eight subscribers. I mean, 10 subscribers would be nice. 20. I mean, you know, I think, I think Mr. Beast has something like 90 million. So, I mean, I'm, I'm so close to getting there. All right. That was fun. Talk to you later. Bye.